the most important thing with the psychotherapy is people don't even know it carries risks. So actual researchers know this. There's a tremendous body of research actually showing that, for instance, people who went to grief therapy after normal bereavement, so you know the loss of a loved one, ended up worse off, more depressed than those who didn't go to therapy. Um, burn victims, first responders, um, there have been all kinds of situations, the D.A.R.E. campaign in schools, in which the idea behind that campaign was to make people better, but actually what they had gone through was fairly normal. People are fairly resistant, resilient. On average, they're overwhelmingly resilient. And these, in, these you know, psychological interventions actually made those people feel worse about their condition. Or in the case of the D.A.R.E. campaign, you remember that D.A.R.E. does say no to yeah. drugs. Oh, yeah. That introduced... Uh, more drug use. We now know that there have been many studies on this, and kids were more likely uh, to be interested in, in drugs after the program. I'm Dave Rubin, and joining me today is a journalist who I don't have to use air quotes for, a New York Times best-selling author and author of the new book, Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up, Abigail Schreier from Los Angeles, dare I say it. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you, Dave? I'm doing just fine. It's good to see you. Uh, we, were, uh, we were compatriots in LA. I left you there as I've left many of my former guests. But you're fighting the good fight, aren't you? I, I am. I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, but but there is, uh, there's a good group of us out here, so uh, we, we take care of each other. So I'm super interested in talking about this book, actually, because one of the, the driving points of the book is not to sort of mock the young people, which is very easy for us to do. It's very easy for us to say, oh, they have purple hair, and they're constantly screaming and all of the, that stuff, and I'm not saying I'm not above it, because I, I hit some of the low-hanging fruit sometime. But the, the real purpose of the book is to show that there's an entire industry that is in many ways designed and set up to kind of make them anxious and upset and angry and miserable. Was that, was that a fair recap? That, that was, and you know, I really, I appreciate that you said that because I worked very hard to take seriously. I began from a point of taking seriously their pain. There's a generation, a lot of people look at them and say, oh, they have no reason to be upset. Um, and you know, they've lived through no world war, no great depression. Why should they be so bummed out? Um, but we have a generation that is lonelier, sadder, more depressed, more anxious than anyone we've ever seen. And interestingly, they've also gotten the most mental health resources. They've had the most therapy of any generation for, for nearly 42% have been in therapy. Huge numbers are on psychiatric drugs and um, and the question is then, why aren't they the picture of mental health? Instead, they're the picture of despair. So, okay, so I wanna get into the flaws in therapy, which you talk about, and the flaws in, in the drugs and a few other things, but let's go to the, the one that I think most people can most obviously point to, uh, which is social media, because you and I are Gen Xers. We grew up in a time uh, when we did not have that stuff. I don't hate technology. I'm not anti-technology. But we all know that technology is doing something to young people that seemingly was an unintended consequence. Perhaps it was intended by some people. Uh, but, but what do you make about that first? That they're all walking around with their, the world in their pocket and the connectivity in their pocket and yet feel alone. I mean, it feels like an oxymoron at some, to some degree. That's right. I mean, let me just say, the social media isn't good. It's bad. We all know it. We've known it for the last eight years. I don't think there's a parent in existence that doesn't know that social media is bad for kids. But do the smartphones explain the whole story? And I think the answer to that is certainly not. There are four reasons um, that smartphones don't completely explain what's wrong with this generation, why they're suffering, and why they don't want to grow up. The first is that adolescent and mental health has been in steady decline since the 1950s. Okay, this is not a new story. Second, small kids, and this is really important, kids age two to eight, okay? These kids don't have smartphones. As of 2016, one in six had a mental health diagnosis. Now, they don't have smartphones now, but they certainly didn't mm -hmm. have them in 2016. So why did one in six of them have a mental health diagnosis? Um, there are two other reasons. Teen boys, this is a new finding this year, um, out from Gene Twenge, 
teen boys from liberal families suffer more, they're in worse distress than conservative girls. What that says to me is that this is environmental. It has something mm -hmm. to do with the way the kid's getting raised. These teen boys, are, they're not on social media more than the girls from conservative families. We know that girls are on way more social media than boys. But somehow teen boys are in more distress if they come from liberal families. And then the fourth thing we know is that in countries like Jap Japan and Israel, where, the, where cell phone use, smartphone use is just as prevalent and um, even more prevalent in the case of Israel among teens, um, mental health is much better. So we know that other countries are doing something we're not, or maybe we're doing something we shouldn't be. All right, so let, let's go backwards there. So in, in the case of Japan and China, I think probably just hearing those two, people can deduce certain things about culture, uh, but is, that, is it as simple as that? A, a culture, a, a society with the sort of, I don't wanna quite say uniculture, but something like that, is just able to deal with the madness of social media more easily? Well, let me, let me tell you, I really looked at countries like Japan, Israel, and Russia um, with the help of a cultural uh, psychologist uh, who I, I talk about in my book, Yulia Chansova uh, Dutton. And one of the things she told me is that um, kids need independence. Kids need autonomy. That means taking risks that involve danger and paying the consequences to some extent. And I'm not talking about running into traffic or, you know, um, uh, you know, anything terribly on you know, playing with drugs, um, you know, or giving them those things, God forbid. But I'm saying a certain amount of risk and danger and independence, we've taken that away from kids, but they need it and they thrive with it. There are two other things that kids really need that they have lost in America, okay? Parental authority. This is something we've exercised with kids Truly, since the beginning of human history, we've known that parents need, um, that kids do best when, kid, when parents are in charge, which doesn't mean unloving parents, but loving and rule-based parents, so-called authoritative parents, have produced the happiest kids, the most successful kids, and the most mentally well kids. And we've known this now for generations. This is one of the most uh, stable psychological findings we have. Um, and then the third things kids need that they're not getting is stable relationships, stable, loving relationships over time. We have replaced grandparents, cousins, siblings in this country, the neighborhood kids with, with friends parents have selected and a series of adults who oversee the kids' every activity. That's just not the kind of thing that promotes uh, healthy you know, attitudes and habits and feeling of, of, of well-being over a lifetime. Do you find it weird, or I guess, did you find it weird when you were writing the book that sort of nothing you've said to me so far, it's not mind blowing, right? Like these are things that we all sort of intuitively know. You're obviously getting the research and, and talking to people on the ground about these things, but like we all know these things one way or another, have the nuclear family, have some extended community, don't stare at phones all day, don't outsource parenting, okay, blah, blah, blah. We all do it though. I mean, that seems to be the disconnect. <laughs> That's right. Actually, and here's the piece that I think we were missing. The mental health professionals have been participating in the problem. Okay. So why did parents give up their authority? Because they outsourced it to mental health experts. They became so convinced that they could traumatize a child if they ever smacked their hand or yelled at them that they could cause trauma. They said, you know what? We're, we're not expert here. We don't really know how to raise our kids. Let's bring in a mental health professional and maybe they can explain what's wrong with my child. And we did that again and again. Um, I think that mental health experts were absolutely a major source of the suffering of the kids we're seeing. Okay, so I definitely want to hit on that because that I thought was one of like the really great points of the book. But you mentioned this thing about teen boys in liberal families. And it's interesting because you said there's sort of like a social contagion there. Your, your previous book, Irreversible Damage, was about the social contagion as it relates to gender confusion, but you were mostly talking about teen girls, or I guess even prepubescent girls, who then thought they were boys. So there's some strange connection there, right? I, I think so. I think what we're seeing is a lot of social contagion. Um, some of it coming through social media, some of it just peer to peer, and some of it coming from the mental health professionals that march in the door and try to te teach every kid that they are disordered, that they, they never say they're shy anymore. They say they have mm -hmm. social phobia. They don't say they're afraid. They say they have anxiety. They never say they're sad. They say they're depressed. They never say they're hyperactive or inattentive or bored in school. They have ADHD. Where did they get the idea that they were all disordered? 
And, mm-hmm. and, and the thing about these mental health diagnoses, if you say you're shy, you can say to someone, well, look, you're shy, get out there, you know, make new friends. I know it's hard, but do it. But if you have a mental health diagnosis, it's much harder to fix yourself. Certainly you can't without a professional or a medication. It's a limiting thing for a child to hear. And unfortunately, they're buying into these limitations. And it's why for the first time we're seeing, you know, 86% of Gen Z says they have menu anxiety. They have trouble ordering um, in a restaurant from a menu by themselves. We've convinced a whole generation that there's something mentally really wrong with them. And so it's playing out. How much do you think COVID and the lockdowns and the years lost there and the speech delays and the litany of other things that we now know have happened is uh, playing into all of this? The lockdowns were terrible for mental health. We know that, we knew it. Um, but, but you knew this, I knew this. Guess who didn't know it? The mental health experts did not issue any, or not one of their organizations issued a single warning as our schools went into a second year of lockdowns. The APA did show up to Congress to protest police tactics, the affirmative mm-hmm. action ruling from the Supreme Court. Um, they, t- they have gone to speak about, to warn Congress about climate anxiety and climate change and the danger of that to mental health. But somehow these so-called professionals um, completely failed to give any warning as in 2020, in the fall of 2020, we headed into a second year of lockdowns. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know, it should at least uh, make you wander. How much of this do you think is coming from the parent? You know, it's interesting because you mentioned the liberal parents of young boys. I suspect that the liberal parents of young girls are still also involved in the social contagion part from your previous book more. But how much of it is just parents that are have ex- have sort of accepted all of the wrong ideas? Like when you mentioned climate anxiety and that sort of thing, no kid actually believes that or has that. They, they've been infected by that. You know, AOC saying we have 12 years to live. That was four years ago, so the clock's a ticking. That's exactly right. And it's a great statistic. It's not mine. It's from Jean Twenge. Um, there was no, you know, she's a liberal uh, researcher. There's no agenda behind the finding. But, but what it shows is that the crisis, the so-called mental health crisis, is not organic. These aren't kids with sch- schizophrenia, by and large, although, you know, we have that problem. And they're not kids with bipolar disorder. These are bummed out kids because of the, he- the unhealthy childhood we've given them. And one of the things we've done, as you mentioned, is pass on our anxiety to our kids. We know anxiety is highly contagious, and we're passing on our worries to our kids, just as you said. Did you ever see the video, uh, it's gone viral, a couple different versions of it, where it's Jordan Peterson talking about the proper way to parent and that what you really want to do is send your kid out to the playground or the backyard or whatever it is until they are exhausted. So at the end of the day, they have dinner and then they go to bed and that so many of the problems are we're keeping them cooped up, they're watching TV all day or they're on their iPad or whatever else and then their bodies are wigging out. Like they have an, an energetic innate need to move and perhaps that is a lot of it too. So it's not just the wrong ideas, it's what that's doing to them physically by not getting out there's, some of the proper stuff. There's no question. And I, you know, I talk about in the book surveillance parenting. We became surveillance. It isn't just that kids need, I mean, as Dr. Peterson said, look, we do need you know, running around but they also need that independence, taking risks, <clears throat> doing things that are a little dangerous without an adult to give them warning. Look, in my kid's school, we have recess monitors. We have bus monitors. They, there are adults who are there to warn you if the monkey bars are slick with rain. You never get the consequence of your you know, um, own judgment. And you know what's interesting? See, I learned this when I was researching the book. In Japan, and these are these are kids who are they're raising much healthier kids in Japan in terms of anxiety and depression. They actually prize independence in kid in kids like they do in Israel, and they actually create on their in their preschools in Japan areas that adults can't see. They have rocks, they have boulders, they have streams. They don't want kids to have an adult run up to them every time they scrape a knee because they want kids who can pick themselves up after the, they scrape a knee and realize they're gonna live. 
you know, you haven't visited us here in, in Miami yet, but I think you'd be very proud at how we're parenting because we kind of let them do their thing and let them explore and they can fall a little bit and their knees are getting nicked up already. And we're trying to balance that. And, and it's a constant balancing act, but, but you have to do it. I will give you some credit because I've met your three beautiful kids a couple times now and I've never seen an iPad or a phone at the table. So you're not just, uh, you're not just preaching this stuff, you're actually putting it into action. Where do you think the, the mental health uh, community, is there a moment in time that they went off the rails or is this just an extension of like, oh, well, we dole drugs out to people and we need patients that show up every week. So yes, of course, we're gonna look to scale regardless of the damage it's doing to society. Well, that's a great question. I mean, there are essentially two so-called mental health crises going on at the same time. There's the very real crisis of schizophrenics on our street, of bipolar patients. These are ki these are um, people suffering greatly who are undertreated and undercared for. And we don't wanna give them the resources because it's really, really hard to help them. It's much easier to do what we're doing now. Look at them and say, wow, lots of people are suffering and then throw preventive mental health resources. And ever since the Second World War, we've done this. We Soldiers came home, some of them were really emotionally shaky, some had PTSD, and we thought, you know what we need? Preventive mental health care. We're gonna start treating the well. And mm -hmm. since that time, the APA membership in the American Psychology Association from 1946 to I think in the 1980s has quadrupled twice. And we started shifting our focus to seeing what, what psychologists or mental health experts could do with already healthy kids. Maybe they could improve them a little. And that's when they introduced problems. They actually made well kids sick and um, by giving them unnecessary treatments. You know, people ask me, are you against therapy? And I say, I'm no more against psychotherapy than I am against chemotherapy. But chemotherapy for people who need it, people with cancer, you don't give it to someone who's well. It's interesting because have, after writing this book, were you able to sort of figure out, well, is it, is it the talk therapy and, and the behavioral therapy that's worse? Or is it the psychotropic drugs and the overindulgence of every behavior, we're just gonna numb it, uh, industry? Both of them are bad. And there's a lot of research to show that first of all, the most important thing with the psychotherapy is people don't even know it carries risks. So. Actual researchers know this. There's a tremendous body of research actually showing that, for instance, people who went to grief therapy after normal bereavement, so, you know, the loss of a loved one, ended up worse off, more depressed than those who didn't go to therapy. Um, burn victims, first responders. Um, there have been all kinds of situations, the D.A.R.E. campaign in schools, in which the idea behind that campaign was to make people better, but actually what they had gone through was fairly normal. People are fairly resistant, resilient. On average, they're overwhelmingly resilient. And these, in, these you know, psychological interventions actually made those people feel worse about their condition. Or in the case of the D.A.R.E. campaign, you remember that D.A.R.E. to say no to yeah. drugs? Oh, yeah. That introduced uh, more drug use. We now know that there have been many studies on this. And kids were more likely uh, to be interested in, in drugs after the program. So was the reasoning for that because they basically put it into every school so kids who were not thinking, I mean, that's sort of what I remember. Do you know the years of yeah. Dare off the top of your head it by chance? the 1980s you know, was, and 1990s. Yeah, so that's when you know you and I were right. elementary school, middle school. And I do remember, th like I had no, no knowledge of drugs right. in sixth or seventh grade. And then next thing you know, they brought in some guy and it was under the Dare thing. I remember it vividly in the gym and he's talking about smoking crack. And like, we thought it was hilarious. Like, right. but then we knew about crack, I guess. And also, it, there are many theories as to <laughs> it why. It sounds crazy to think right. about. Right, I, I mean, it is, but it was a total failure. We know it was a f total failure. It followed the techniques of a very famous psychologist. And the idea was um, to go into schools and just get kids to open up about uh, drug use. and. Somehow that encouraged drug use. We don't know if it's because it hadn't occurred to them or they felt like afterwards it was widespread. Some people think they went home and had conversation with the parents and parents opened up to them about their drug use and that encouraged it. But for whatever reason, all this discussion in a population that overwhelmingly hadn't yet tried drugs encouraged it. And we're doing the same thing with distress, with anxiety and depression. We're marching into schools and we're telling everybody about suicide all the time. We're telling everyone 
everyone about depression and anxiety all, all the time. The mental health staff of schools are doing this. And lo and behold, we have a generation over half, you know, 60% of them does not believe their mental health is good. Did you find there are any um, prescriptions to defeat the prescriptions? I mean, I, I suppose family and, and some of the things you reference right up top, but I mean, systemically when it comes to all of the, the institutions that are pushing all of this stuff, the schools that are pushing all of this stuff, the pharmaceutical companies that are pushing all this stuff, like it's almost, in some ways, it's like too big to defeat in a bizarre sense. It is, we need less of it. We need to shrink it. So if we shrink mental health staffs in schools, then the school counselors will be forced to deal with the kids who actually have problems. Right now they have the resources and they're increasing. They're presenting themselves as the solution. So they're talking to every kid about their trauma. And that's what the problem is. It isn't that drugs are never appropriate. It's that we're showering them. Do you know teachers are the number one source of referral for ADHD medication? Now that tells you a lot. Teachers are, are, are sort of conflicted, right? Because if they want a child bolted to their seat. Now, I've mm -hmm. talked to parents who say one year my, te my teacher told me my kid had ADHD. The next year they said he was a great student. And no one says, well, to be honest, I'm not a very good teacher. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or back in our day, it's like you had a kid in your class who was a little kind of nutty and right. the they dealt with him as they ha had to deal with him, but you weren't drugging everybody. No. I mean, that, that's the fundamental. But, but what do you do in a time when these institutions have become so politicized, they've, got, they've all gone so woke, you're not going to get the, the, someone from the teachers union to come in and be like, all right, we're firing the half of the mental health experts because they believe that stuff. Right. I mean, you have to start with the idea that uh, of, you know, parents know best. First of all, parents need to remember that they know a lot more than they think. And it's completely ridiculous to think as many mental health experts will tell you, I talk about it in my book, the Daniel J. Siegel, the very, you know, well-known popular um, book um, begins with w one of them begins with the idea that parents just don't know enough about their children's brains. Well, I interviewed a lot of neurobiologists, neuropsychologists, and academic psychologists, and they will be the first to tell you, none of us knows very much about the emotion <laughs> regulation of the brain. And the idea of making parents feel that they aren't adequate to raising a child because they aren't neurobiologists or neuropsychologists is ridiculous. So I would start from you know, the idea that parents actually do tend to know what's best for their kids. But the other thing is, you know, Kids are, and human beings are phenomenally resilient, okay? Most kids actually exposed to truly um, traumatic experiences will recover just fine. That's been the story of human history. And if you think back to your grandparents, that doesn't mean that it's not, it's fun to go through the death of a loved one or anything else, you know, traumatic. But if you look back, the story of human history has been one of resilience. And when researchers look over, look into this, like George Bonanno did, the 9-11 victims, he found overwhelmingly that, that people who had lost loved ones in the Twin Towers, people who had witnessed the attacks, overwhelmingly the story was one of resilience without any psychotherapy or medication. If we leave people alone, if they surround themselves with loved ones, if they do things in the world, they tend to repair themselves just fine. Well, in, with that being said, I mean, did you learn anything about the inability for people to have functioning families now uh, while you were researching this? Because that, I guess, is ultimately what this comes down to. That, that has been really tough on kids. There's no question. And here's the thing. Parents have been replacing grandparents they don't like or maybe who say the wrong things with experts. Oh, you know, here's a soccer coach I've hired for you. Here's a therapist I've hired. Here's to, to sort of babysit their kids all day long. And the problem with all these hired helpers, the speech therapist, the, you know, the, you know, various forms of physical therapists the kid may or may not need, if they need them, fine. But it's no substitute for family because they're being hired to take care of you. Kids know that. But with grandparents, grandparents don't always say the right thing. Cousins don't always do the right thing. But the love is actually real. And kids feel that and they know that. And when they grow up with those stable relationships, they're so much more solid than if you manage and you get the perfect nanny. <laughs> and they might be the perfect nanny, but after a year or two, they go back to graduate school and then you're stuck again. How much of you do you think is that people just had no idea what technology was going to do? So, you know, 
we sort of hit this, but like at the beginning it was like, oh, it's gonna connect you to all of these people. We're just gonna give it to you, have a computer in your room, have an iPad in your bed. Really, with the best of intentions, having no idea the amount of adult stuff and illegal stuff and all of that, you leave that to them, a kid is just gonna go down that rabbit hole where now maybe there'll be a shift just because we know what the internet is, we know the nature of the internet a little bit more, so maybe the next generation after Z get some other version of all of this. I, I definitely hope so. I mean, but I, I will say that, look, Gene Twangy and Jonathan Haidt have done a lot of work on the, uh, to show how bad, you know, the, the smartphones have been for kids. They undeniably have been. Um, we've, this is something we've known now for eight years was when they first alerted the public to this. You know, my own book talks about the dangers of social media influencers. This was four years ago with the spreading the gender dysphoria contagion. So this is something we've known about. Why haven't parents felt like they could do anything about it? Well, for one, the mental health professionals have actually undercut their ability. Many of them warn the public about, you know, warn parents not to undercut their relationship with their kids, to be afraid to exercise their own authority in their home because the kid may experience trauma or loneliness without their phones. They feel that they can't, but there's something else too. The phones are bad, but do you remember when we were kids? They used to um, advertise things like Frosted Flakes and they, they would have this bowl of sugar cereal and then you'd have on one side the hard boiled egg and on one side the, the, you know, the wheat toast and they would say Frosted Flakes, part of a nutritious breakfast. <laughs> and we all knew yeah. it wasn't good for you, but it was yeah. part of a nutritious breakfast because the other stuff was pretty good. And the problem is in the last generation, we've swapped out all the other stuff that was good. So yeah, the cell phones are bad, but you know what else is bad? Kids don't have independent time that isn't overseen by their parents. Kids aren't allowed to take any risks. They aren't walking home from school. They aren't hanging out for hours with friends, riding their bikes around with, without a parent overseeing it or tagging them with a, you know, an Apple tag or whatever. Uh, so they, you know, I, I talk to teenagers whose parents track their every move on an app on their phone with Life 360. Yeah. These kids have no freedom. And then, of course, social media. Now, every mistake they made is broadcast. Um, we need to go back. We need to get rid of a lot of the stuff, including parents hovering surveillance of their kids. And we need to teach them right and wrong so that, you know, and that requires parental authority, they need to tell them what's right and wrong and then let them exercise their own judgment. The problem is parents aren't exercising authority, so they don't have kids with judgment. And now they have- Doesn't it also, yeah, well, it also seems like there's a compounding problem. So you watch your kid all day long, so now you're, you're putting this kid in the controlled environment, they're not being able to take the risks, that's a problem. You're watching them, so they're being trained to be part of a surveillance state, basically, all day long for their whole life. But then also the day that you no longer, when they're 18, or you probably extend it now into the 20s, but like the day that that app shuts off and they're free, they're gonna all go bananas. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's what we're seeing in, in, in schools. So one of the um, psych wonderful psychologists I talked to, this woman at, who runs the Emotions Lab at Georgetown University, and she looks at why are kids so much more dysregulated in America? Why does she have um, American stu college students who when they list things they're afraid of and things they make them anxious, they cite normal routine incidents of life, like seeing a stranger give them a weird look as they walk down the street. But in other cultures, um, when they mention um, things they're afraid of or dangers, they list actual dangers, things, situations <laughs> that are actually more dangerous. And part right. of the reason that, that, we're, that they're not able to regulate, they're not able to evaluate dangers is because we surveil them throughout their childhood completely. We manage them there. I refer to it as a veal calf life. They're sort of ca trapped in our little cages. And then we leave them We leave them completely for college and they have a nervous breakdown. The first time a professor gives them a bad grade or the first time they're rejected, they have no ability to handle it because we never let them have a thousand normal shocks of a healthy childhood. Right, although then we also hand them off to a college that not only completely infantilizes them, but then if you're white or more particularly Jewish, then they're allowed to call for genocide against you. Then you might really have some mental problems. Yeah, and then they have the mental health Or some staff. insecurities, let's say. Right, and they tell you to go see the mental health staff. That's what they say. <laughs> you have a problem, why don't you go see one of our counselors? They're treated like they're mental health patients, so they're behaving like them. Are you hopeful that we can fix some of this stuff? 
I mean, believe it or not, this stuff I'm really hopeful about because I think the problem is the experts. I think they are now presenting themselves as the solution. They've presided over a disaster. It's very obvious that they aren't the solution. And if parents just go back to our instincts, if we go back to our traditions of parenting, which involves a certain amount of knock it off or shake it off, you're going to be fine. If we go back to teaching our kids that we have faith, that they're going to survive that heartbreak. Yes, she dumped you or he dumped you or whatever it was. You're going to be fine. We're not going to run interference with every teacher who's mad at you. We're going to let you handle it. If we go back to those things, it's amazing. We are built to be resilient and, and kids can absolutely go back to that. Does some of this just strike you as kind of where we would end up naturally as a society that you, you know, you're in the nascent stage of a technology we're watching sort of, you know, 200 plus years of America change and how the internet changes that no matter what we were going to get here, it's not that it can't correct, but we were going to get to a pretty precarious place literally with our children. I mean, your previous book, which I reference on my show probably twice a week, okay. like that, the fact that we let so many people let the expert class, quote unquote, okay. decide what gender their children are. It's like, it's insane, but in another way, it feels sort of obvious to me. Yeah, I think parents stop. I mean, the one thing that the two books have in common is that parents stop trusting their own instincts with their kids. You know, almost one of the amazing things about my last book is that what I went to interview, and I probably talked to by the end a thousand parents because after I wrote the book, you know, I had talked to probably hundreds. And then in the years after the book, so many parents kept reaching out to me. So I probably talked to a thousand American parents. And one of the things I learned was how completely parents had come to rely on experts for, to fix whatever was wrong with their kids. But another thing too, nearly every one of the girls who went off track, who decided she was transgender, they had an expert already. They were seeing a therapist and it wasn't uh. a gender therapist. That's the thing. It wasn't an activist. It was a normal vanilla therapist. They took their daughter to for anxiety and her depression who sat through ex exploratory therapy and said, Huh, do you think what could what else could be wrong? We talked a lot about your mom. What let's talk now about your gender. I saw a study, I, I'm hopefully getting this right, that one in ten Americans are on prescription drugs at this point, you know, some sort of psychotropic drugs. So let's say that's that's roughly right. I mean, that's now. Yeah. You take these kids and, and then now scale that up. I mean, it can't be good for a society, even for whatever percentage of this is legitimate, for the people that legitimately have those issues, which you're referencing, uh, that cannot be good for a society at scale. That's right, and here's the thing, here's the problem with, it's the problem with therapy, it's the problem with psychiatric medications. Kids aren't in a good position to push back against the excess. Kids can't say, I don't, I don't feel right, I know what my sex drive was before, and now I have none, I don't like that. Okay, adolescents are not in a position to say that. They just don't have a sex drive, and they don't know any different. They see the they are gain, they gain weight. They go through all kinds of emotional blunting, and they don't know. They don't. They can't reference a time when they felt better. Adults can, so adults can make those adjustments. But children who have never gone through the experience of being dumped, or, or being cut from a team, or failing at something and recovering. They don't know what they can handle. And then we put them on these drugs and they get to adulthood and they don't believe they can ever handle routine incidents of adulthood. And, and unfortunately, because we never let them develop that emotional musculature, they may be right. They can't handle it. We never let them try. Do you think that the people who either lock the kids down and the teachers unions and then the people who drug them or then confuse them about their gender or did some combination of all of those three do you think they need some comeuppance? Or I know you think they need some comeuppance, but does, like, what needs to happen to these people? Or let's just do the gender one for a second. Like, what should happen to these doctors who have done all of this and the therapists who have confused all of these kids and everything else? Is it just about having their license taken away? I mean, like, what really has to happen to set us right? Well, I don't see licenses taken away because they were, this is the thing, they were acting very much in accord with what the advice of their own professional organizations was. See, that's the thing. They were acting according to protocol. The protocols were bad. 
these mm -hmm. groups, these professional organizations had no idea what they were doing and they weren't following any of the research. And I see that again and again. When I interviewed, I interviewed dozens and dozens of academic psychologists and psychiatrists and I, I, you know, we dove into the research on anxiety and depression in adolescents. But we also dove into the research on therapy and the harms of therapy, including increasing anxiety, increasing depression, alienating you from family members, feeling of incapacity, feeling like you're dependent on an adult or a therapist to give you the answer because you can't trust yourself, okay? These are all things we're seeing in the rising generation. But when I talk to the researchers, this is all well known. When I talk to the therapists, they either denied or minimized it, which tells me that the clinicians don't even know the risks of the therapy they're giving. Again, it just strikes me like the, con the conditions are not, or the pressures are not right. Like if you're a therapist and so now you've got somebody for seven years, they started with, th they're seven, now they're 14, like the chances that you'd be like, all right, well, we really did wrap up that thing and you're 14 now, so go out and conquer the universe. You still want the check. This is a problem. Right. I mean, listen, let me sa tell you, I talked to some great therapists and, you know, obviously I'm not talking about people whose children are in crisis and they can't stabilize mm -hmm. the child because those people, those kids absolutely need help. There's not a question about that to me. But I've also talked to really good therapists um, who I quote in the book and I talked to. One of them is Camilo Ortiz, who's a professor of, of, of psychology and, and also a clinician. And... Um, one of the things he does at the beginning of therapy, and he treats kids with discrete disorders. He specifically is there to attack their obsessive compulsive disorder or their phobias. And he starts the therapy by assessing it and then saying, we're gonna need X number of sessions. He doesn't treat children as an annuity. He doesn't say, oh great, this is a new income stream for me for the rest of, mm -hmm. of your life. Because he knows that kids can become totally, adolescents, can become totally dependent on a therapist, even as they're trying to emerge into an adulthood. They, and they, right, so they'll be afraid to do things on their own. So that's the type of guy, basically, that we need writing out the next version of, of all of the regulations around this. Let me ask you one other thing, a pure hypothetical, sure. which is, let's say you had an 18-month-old 18 uh, 18 son named Justin, just purely hypothetically, and he was a great eater, but then suddenly you put the strawberries, you put the cheese, and you put the uh, chicken in front of him, and he only wants to eat the strawberries and refuses the cheese and the chicken. What do you do? Well, you Sometimes know. throwing it at you, by the way, <laughs> the chicken. Well, I mean, he's only 18 months. But um, I, would, I would say this, I talk a lot about gentle parenting in the book, which is all the, the rage, you know, this is the therapeutic style of parenting where you never assert your authority with the kids and the kids never face the consequences of their action. There's no punishment. They call it consequences, but there really is no punishment. And at a certain point, kid needs punishment, right? Now I'm not talking 18 months where they can't even <laughs> register it. But at a certain point, you know, I read stories of parents who are getting hit and kicked and bitten by kids who are five and six years old or older. No, 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 no. And at that these are kids who are never sent to their rooms. And I know this because they say that on their ch parent chats. They say, you know, we're a no punishment family. We have a calming corner. It's not working. Yeah. <laughs> We're a no punishment family with a comic quarter. Then the parent is locked in the right. basement getting fed fish heads once a week and the kids upstairs raising hell. Uh, Abigail, my friend, it was a pleasure seeing you. The link to the book is right down below and I uh, hope you and Zach make it to the free state of Florida one of these days so you can, you. you can judge my parenting skills at 18 <laughs> and 16 months. I'm sure they're amazing. Thank you so much sure. and I'll see you soon. For more insightful discussions on how to live the good life, check out our Lifestyle Playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.